Hello, David here at merchantaccounts.ca. Today I'm talking to Ryan Thrash, co-founder of ModX. Ryan has many years of expertise in open source content management software, e-commerce, and basically helping businesses create effective websites. I'm gonna pick Ryan's brain today, why it's so hard to build a website, and hopefully pick up some good tips on how to do it properly. Ryan, thanks for joining today. Hey David, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk today. Awesome. I'm just going to jump straight in here. So it's 2023 and it's still kind of hard to make a good website. Why is it hard for people to build a website? So I would actually argue that it's really easy to build websites. Um, however, building a great website that'll really help a business grow and scale, um, being able to crush conversion and SEO, for instance, is a big challenge. Um, and there's really kind of different, like there's different phases of business uh, businesses in general and in a life life cycle of a business, there's different phases of when you probably should invest in uh, building better, more robust websites. That makes sense. So, for instance, um, if you're just starting out, you really just need a way for people to kind of find out what your product is, what your big idea is, being able to understand uh, and communicate with customers so that they can figure out is this something that I want to do, and that's. That's kind of when your pre-product market fit is kind of a, a phrase that's tossed around a lot. And that basically means, are people gonna pay me for, uh, for my goods or services? And so finding that product market fit um, is more important in shaping your product development. Of course, there's also other types of websites like blogs or information, informational things that, that don't really necessarily uh, center around kind of marketing uh, a business or things like that. And those are, those are a completely different area. And those are, those are available on a lot of hosted services like uh, um, a medium or uh, I'm trying to think of the, the latest one. Anyway, medium is, is a good example of one of those, or just a, a plain old WordPress uh, spin up a free site on wordpress.com. Um, there's a lot of other hosted services as well. Uh, whether it be uh, Jimdo in Europe or uh, WordPress or Wix here in the States, um, those are other options as well. And, and those, those allow you to have really fast ones, uh, as does like the theme ecosystem for WordPress. Interesting. So I think what you're saying then is before you start, and I was going to get to this eventually anyways, picking the right platform for your type of business is very important then it's it's crucial uh, it well so in two were in, in on one hand it's uh probably one of the most important things if your business relies on leads or selling things directly online um and covid kind of made that a, a mandatory requirement for just about everybody every organization anyone the first place that somebody is going to go is look up your website, see what it is. They're either gonna use it as a launch point of, oh yeah, what's the phone number I need to call them or uh, logging in and starting to work, uh, logging in and starting to work in your good, in your service or in your uh, product that you're, you're doing or placing orders online, uh, ordering things. Mm -hmm. So um, the right platform at the right time is important. Again, going back to that product market fit idea, when you're figuring things out, figuring out the best version of whatever it is that you're going to be selling or, or offering to customers, um, it's not as important. When you start investing in really scaling and optimizing conversion, scaling and optimizing lead gen, uh, investing in digital advertising, either, either paid or organic, um, you start to run into uh, limitations on some of these platforms. And that's where things like speed and security really start to be primary drivers for the platform that you're going to choose. Right, right. So that that comes back. And I know that speed is one of the things that Google looks at a lot these days. So then how do you get started? So you have a, you have a logo and you have an idea. And I'm going to focus on e-commerce for this conversation. So like, what do you do? Like, how do you, how do you even go about getting started? It, the, as with everything in life, it depends. Um, but I'm going to assume that you're a non-technical, non-web developer. Um, there's a couple of venues. One, you go hire a, a web developer or a web designer to build something for you. Um, or you can go to 
a theme store or a Squarespace or a Wix and say, I want to just throw all this information up there really quick, start talking to customers, start interacting to figure out what's going to work. And those are all super viable ways. Uh, buy, a, buy, a, a, you know, buy a theme uh, and install it into a site. And then you, you can real quickly determine, um, you can real quickly determine what's going to work and how you want your site to look and work and behave. Um, so that's how I would personally start. Uh, well, actually, I would personally start very differently because I come from the background of building websites, and so it's a different story. But once you've kind of achieved that product market fit, and that, that'll oftentimes, at least here in the States, that'll probably come somewhere in between a quarter of a million to half a million dollars in revenue, upwards of a million to two million dollars in revenue, depending on the type of industry that you're in. But once you kind of reach that aha moment of, I've kind of figured out what we're going to be as a business, then it probably makes sense to optimize the foundation, the platform for what you're doing. Now, that might mean um, investing heavily in, in hiring somebody to, to build out a very optimized website that performs and gives you the best opportunity to win in organic search uh, and the best opportunity to integrate with the tools that you need to integrate uh, to run your business. So, so now we're getting into the topic of custom versus platforms then, is that correct? So unlimited resources, uh, not many companies with that, but you know, Berkshire Hathaway is building a new website. Do they use a platform or do they build it? Cut Well, maybe that's a bad example because it's not a product website, but Netflix, maybe that's a better example. And they wanna maximize those conversions. Are they going to use a platform or are they going to go custom? So you've, you've got multiple tiers. Um, your enterprise, uh, your big enterprise customers will do a mix. Um, a lot of times, like, and Netflix, for instance, is, is heavily, heavily, heavily data driven. And that's been one of their strong suits from day one. They're going to be pure custom application across the board, period. Um, when you get into some of the larger enterprise customers, um, you're going to start looking at, they're typically gonna deploy on a platform. And the reason that they're doing a platform is those enterprise customers, are they may be a, a chain of restaurants. It might be a, uh, an enterprise uh, software, analytics software. Um, they'll typically wind up choosing a platform. Um, and then, there's this big swath in the middle ground that I like to call the fortuneless five million. And what that means is, is really pretty <laughs> simple. It's not the small mom and pop shops that, uh, that are vital and awesome and a great place to start, but that's kind of the, the early product market fit stage or, or businesses that have not achieved, um, high transactional volume yet. And so, uh, it's not focusing on that side. It's also not focusing on the global 5,000 or the Fortune 500 that you think of here in America. Um, it's really the those those people that have figured out what their business is going to be. They know what they're going to do when they grow up, so to speak. And it's this large swath of businesses that probably most people in America would never have heard of. It's your your nut and bolt manufacturers in, in middle America that's selling 15. $20 million of, of building supplies and industrial fixtures and, and things of that nature. It's all these businesses that, that nobody has heard of. Uh, that's not, not nobody, but you know, the bulk and majority of America will not have heard of them. Fantastic, large growing businesses can hugely benefit from adopting a platform that takes care of a whole lot of the things that are important to get right, uh, security, speed, uh, flexibility, integration points, all the things like that, that, that as you grow and get more sophisticated in your sales and marketing activities, you really do need to be able to plug into a whole lot of different tools. So that's where a platform really can help uh, speed things along. Because why reinvent the wheel? I know, I know that's a part of it. So, so you know, I, I want to get to talking about ModX in a moment because I know you've built a platform to solve a lot of these problems. But before I talk about ModX, I want to talk about the platform that people are probably familiar, with, more familiar with, which is WordPress and WooCommerce too. So that's, I think, undisputably the most popular. What are the problems with it? And in fairness, what are the benefits with it? And this is in, meant for people that are kind of building their first or one of their first websites. WordPress is an awesome platform. 
first and foremost, end of story. Um, it actually powers approximately 45% of the entire you know, public facing websites on the internet today. Huge success story. Mm -hmm. They've built an incredible business. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool. Um, first, you know, if you're in that early stage of trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up, it's a great tool because there are virtually limitless numbers and options for starting themes, for website builders, for plugins, for different functionalities to different services. And that's, that's really, really useful because it helps you get super quick, easy, fast wins. And that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge that you run into with that, though, is it's also one of, one of the problems that can crop up is depending on which of your plugins that you've selected, and there's hundreds of thousands, I would suspect, to choose from, their search taps out at about 9,999 9 options per category that you search in. So you, right. you have a huge variety of choices to choose from. And so on one hand, that's great. On the other hand, which of the 10,000 plugins that you're going to let me look at do I choose? What happens if one of them happens to contain a security vulnerability or a, uh, an update breaks another one of the plugins that breaks yet another one of the plugins, and all of a sudden now you've got to figure out how to roll back and do developer -y things on your website. I hear WordPress people say they kind of describe it as like a Frankenstein website in a way at some point when you get too many different modules or plugins conflicting with each other. Pluginitis is real. Um, it, it is <laughs> definitely uh, something that can be a blessing and a curse. Um, uh, where we kind of differ in the way that we work is we, we, we tend to have a, a very uh, configurable uh, set plugins that can be used for a wide variety of surface uh, uh, solutions. So for instance, menu builders uh, in, in WordPress, there's at least 10,000 or excuse me, at least 9,999 of them because I've, I've, I've looked for those there. Um, and in Mod X, there's a, there's a handful of menu builders. Um, but that handful of menu builders in the Mod X world can emulate and build all 9,999 variations of those menus. Uh, we very much are in favor of uh, configuration over convention in, in, uh, in our solution. Uh, we're also highly, highly, highly focused on, on delivering very fast website speed and on really, really locking down security. Um, early on in our, our uh, history of, of open source software, we made a choice to adopt a, a database technology uh, called PDO. And that's just a, a, a big PHP convention and uh, uh, our tool set. And, and what PDO does is it really helps secure and lock down things. And that turned out to be a very fortuitous uh, architectural decision early on because it really does make for a much safer uh, website at the, at the end of the day. Um, in fact, when, when Drupal adopted that same Thing, I believe with Drupal 7 or Drupal 8, um, if you track the security vulnerabilities that are reported for the various major open source softwares, uh, WordPress obviously is in there, Drupal's in there, we're in there, Joomla's in there. But if you track those, uh, those security vulnerability reports, um, ours has been very, very, very modest. We have an exceptional security track record. In the 10 plus years that Modox has been around, I think we're up to 41 reported vulnerabilities in the uh, National Institutes of Standards and Technologies.gov website. I think it's in our NTIS or in NIST website. So, um, so for folks that don't know, Ryan, because for most people, they'll have no idea, like there's no benchmark. So how many would WordPress have in that time frame? Um, they will get approximately 40 every other day. Um, and that's all going <laughs> today. Uh, there, uh, last time we updated the site with the tracks that they were in the five or 6,000 range. So security is uh, super critical too, because, uh, and I spoke to you about this before uh, on a previous conversation. People don't, people take security seriously because they think of getting hacked, but what's getting damaged is 
you can patch your server, but how do you patch your credibility? Yeah, so the, you know, one of the worst things that could happen is a, a site breaks and it goes down and goes offline. And that's really bad because nobody can then figure out how to contact you. And that's, that's bad from a reputational damage perspective. Um, probably what's even worse though, is if somebody goes to your website and instead of selling, you know, um, instead of selling uh, t-shirts or whatever it is that you're selling or, or offering information about your service, all of a sudden you've now been redirected to a site that's, you know, transparently it's going to be selling pills or porn. And that's hugely reputationally damaging. Um, oh, because they're hijacking it. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of hacks exist. There's, there's, there's a, there's a, a, a handful of things that happens when hackers attack a website. Um, one, they want to deface it and put up their uh, banner of this site's been owned by somebody. And those, those are typically what are called script kitties. And they're just out there running these programmatic kits of uh, attack vectors and just launching all of them against the website and seeing what sticks. Um, another one is that's uh, been very, very prevalent is they'll compromise a website and install a crypto miner um, that sends all the crypto that they happen to be able to mine to their wallet. Oh, they're using the CPU cycles on that server. So they're using the server CPU cycles to, uh, to, for profit, for fun and profit. Right. A lot of them right. will use and set up phishing websites. So they'll make a website that looks like uh, your bank login or a, uh, a consumer service login, and they'll try to uh, use that to harvest usernames and passwords so that they can then go and take over those those deals. They'll send spam. Um, everybody gets tons of spam every single day. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, those are kind of your predominant ones. Or they'll redirect to, uh, you know, what a lot of people would consider uh, less than savvy or less than savory um, options for uh, web content in the world. Well, okay, well, I, definitely I see the, the point of security and let's, let's talk a little bit. So one of the things that you said that really interests me is the, well, you didn't use this word, but in my mind, editability. So when you have a, when you have a platform, like coming from my background, because 20 more, more years ago, I was a developer, I'm not anymore. But I hated picking off the shelf stuff because I knew if the menu was on the right and I wanted to move it to the left, it'd be like a hassle. So how do you make something powerful without making it like editable, without making it too complicated? Yeah, so there's been a big movement towards uh, website builders, if you will, kind of visual drag and drop website builders. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a really, really great solution. Um, the problem with a lot of them, however, is that they tend to create all this extra code and markup that really serves nothing, serves no, no purpose let me back. It. it definitely serves a purpose. It's how it was architected and it's how they achieved the end goal of designing a website that looks and behaves like the, the user that's building it wants it to look and behave. Um, and that's good. Mm -hmm. um, where it can be a problem, however, is when it creates divs upon divs upon divs and nested bloated code and all of a sudden that drags down the performance of your, of your website. And that becomes mm -hmm. a really big problem as you talked about earlier websites, especially Google, and as Google goes, so goes the entire rest of the search injury, in injury the search industry. Um, and that, that's, that's just a reality of, to, of today. So if you can make Google happy, you're going to typically do well with every other search index out there. Um, and speed is important. Um, I think probably everybody's had an example or, or can recall, they've gone to a website, they're trying to wait for it to load, a few seconds go by, it's still not loading, and you just say, forget it, I'm gonna to go to the second result in the search, or the third result in the right. search, or a different website entirely. And those slow performances, uh, the slow page loads, really can have a very negative impact on visitor engagement, and absolutely are now a key ranking signal in, in how Google figures out who's gonna be at the top of the list on page one. Absolutely, when you choose a platform that's one of like a bloated website that inevitably impacts it. So how have you made your platform so speedy? So it was a design uh, decision made that goes back to some early days when I was uh, infatuated with CSS, which stands for 
cascade, cascading style sheets. And, and for people mm -hmm. that don't know what that is, that's kind of the one of the ways that you can make things that are on the web look the way that you want them to look. You know, for a font, you mm -hmm. say, I want it in this font, in this size, in this color, with this shadow. And it's just a styling guide that tells, you know, boxes and, and things, how they should lay out on the page and whatnot. And the reason that was important is when I was working on an e an, another open source e-commerce project at the time, um, that was when dial-up modems were the predominant internet access. So that's back going back into the 90s. Um, and back then, a, a 32K or 64K internet connection was really, really fast. 128K ISDN line was really fast. And then you went up to the uh, T1s if you had a, a big budget right. you know, to spend $1,000 a month for a 1.04 megabit per mm -hmm. second internet connection. That was blazing fast back then. And what we started noticing mm -hmm. is that uh, getting into CSS, and in, and in those days, every browser interpreted CSS differently, and there were all these obscure hacks, and it drove developers crazy because it was completely inconsistent and arbitrary. This is the Netscape days, right? Yes, Netscape, early Internet Explorer, early yeah. Mozilla. Uh, slash Firefox. So back in those days, even pre Safari, uh, back in those days, it was a it was a wild west of of weird uh, hacks that you would make in your CSS definitions to make it work across browsers and render consistently. What we saw though is those pages that were styled with CSS were typically uh, kilobytes, many kilobytes, tens or hundreds of kilobytes smaller than a comparable. Uh, they were built with, t you know, nested table layouts. Uh, don't need to get into it. They were just a much, they were 50 to 100% larger in size. And what we saw in the e-commerce world specifically was that these smaller pages and these smaller markup really and truly led to more conversion. So you would sell more if you had a faster website. Um, and so that was really where I had my aha moment way back when was, why don't we make, uh, and the, the technical phrase for that was semantic markup. You know, if, if it was a okay. headline, you wrapped it in a headline tag. If it was a paragraph on the page, you wrapped it in a paragraph tab, not nesting it in all these nested table descriptions and TDs, um, or table data is what that was. So um, that semantic markup also coincidentally um, early on, Google would use that semantic markup to know, aha, this is the H1. That's the most important headline on the page. That helps me figure out what this page is about. So it also, yeah. at that time, using and adopting those methodologies, uh, really helped in the search and organic search. Um, so uh, fortuitous that, that we chose that. And so we always, from day one, said we don't want to prescribe the markup or the the technologies that you use in order to build and present your website. Um, we care about the data and we care about making it as easy as possible for a non-technical user to input that data to build out that website and to arrange and visually structure the website and, and called information architecture of how your pages lay out, where your home page is, what links off of that, all of those things. But we always were very um, adamant about making it easy for somebody to be as absolutely light as possible if they wanted to with their web templates or as robust as they wanted to. And so we, uh, we early on made the choice that we were going to have no forced template system. We would give you, if you had a field called content, uh, we would have a little tag that you could insert and drop into your markup and it would replace that content tag with whatever the contents of that field was. And so that's how we uh, uh, tackled it and addressed it. In fact, with our very first release of our software, the first public release when we said, yes, this is 1.0 software was back in 2005. And you could have built in 2005, a website using HTML5, CSS3 and React, even though those technologies didn't exist at that time. Uh, we were completely output agnostic, and that, that's really neat. Um, just like today, 
you can use it to power a web service if it, a web service if you want to by outputting XML or JSON data. Uh, and so you can be very creative with what you can do in, in the Modic CMS platform. Uh, and it's very, very fast about how it does it. If it's not purely dynamic data, it'll cache it out of the box on the first page load and it's then just displaying functionally static text. And then you're talking about getting into optimization of your web serving stack, not, not the uh, page generator that you're using to generate pages. I, I can see obviously your level of technical expertise is very, very sophisticated. Is ModX a good fit for someone who's not? Is it good for someone who's not technical? Um, Again, it gets back to where are you in the stage of your lifestyle. It is, um, it is a fantastic tool if you know the basics of HTML, CSS. It is a, a better tool, I would argue, than most for learning how to do some basic rudimentary uh, uh, web development and web coding. If you're looking for the drag and drop plug and play website building experience, uh, that's frankly where, where we don't shine as well today. Um, but that's something that we're working on. We do have a really awesome, uh, our take on a drag and drop website builder, uh, where it exceptionally ch shines is uh, for companies that have design libraries, for instance. And they say, these are how a blog page should look, or this is how a new product page should look, or this is how a new home, these are the types of elements that you could put on a, on a page for a new home in this development that we're putting together to have different blocks for different amenities and things like that. Um, with our, our front end editor, which is called Fred, um, with our front end editor, Fred, you can create these drag and drop blocks and then fill in the blank on the front end, save it, and you're now off to the races uh, with it. So the long answer is there's not a huge existing theme e ecosystem for quick, fast wins today. Um, something we certainly want to be addressing down the road. But we're again, we've really kind of focused on that on that post product market fit uh, environment where now we want to start building a custom website that fits our exact business, not well, yeah, not adapting your business to fit whatever somebody's impression of how how yours should work. So you're describing someone who knows what their problems are. So maybe it's not good for version 1.0 of your website, but when you went to WordPress, you got frustrated. You were with Shopify, you got frustrated. Actually, and I wanna talk about that for a second. I spoke to a merchant just yesterday. Little story about this. So when you pick a platform, my belief is you're picking a partner. And because I've worked with banks for 20 years, I'm absolutely allergic to bureaucracy. It drives me mental. <laughs> exactly. Trust me. I am too. So in this, this merchant, they sold like a really neat LED decorative lamp and they were killing it. They were doing like $7 million a month in sales. So they got 0.7% chargebacks at some point, which is enough to get on a visa early uh, warning program. And so they, they ended up, the long to short is Shopify canceled them. And it's like they had 0.7% chargebacks. That's it, that's, that's nothing, that's a blip. And the problem is they can't get to anybody who cares. And so if you choose a platform, the, the, the beauty of it is the platform's dealing with the security, they're dealing with the uptime, they're dealing with the problems, but you've got to deal with them when there's an issue. So how does ModX approach openness, ownership of your data, that type of thing? Sure. So um, our, we still have our open source content management system and it, it powers millions of websites around the world. And that means that there's a huge community of people out there that are excited about helping. We have a forum, there's a Slack group. Um, so you've got that level of, of help. There's just a lot of people in the open, open source ecosystem that enjoy helping other people, that have businesses to help other people. Um, so there's that. We have a Modex Professionals uh, listing on our website of developers that are vetted to be Modex site builders around the world that you can get help from. Um, when you get into the, the, the actual hosting environment per se, 
um, our Monarchs Cloud environment is how we generate the bulk majority of our revenues. And that is a very robust, very high performance, very security focused, shockingly. Um, very, very, it, we, we really focus on speed, security, and collaboration workflow and in our hosting environment. Um, and I think if you look at our website and you, and you start doing some digging around on it, people love the support that we offer and provide. We do a really good job. We try to, we try to help people as much as we possibly can. That, that even gets into implementation details. Um, so it goes far beyond just uh, making sure that there's no hacks. If there is a security incident that we're helping people work through that, uh, because it is, it is and can be configured anyway. People can can make an act, you know, can have an accidental mixed configuration that says, "Oh, you've allowed arbitrary file uploads." That probably is not a good idea, and somebody then figured out where those files were stored and and uh, and, and called that and, and was able to gain a, a level of privilege or access that they shouldn't have had access to. We help mm. people solve those problems, um, and so we're really focused on customer uh, success with with Modox, um, both in the open source community and in, in our hosting platform. So ModX, I didn't even realize. So you could download ModX and install it on your own infrastructure. 100%. Happens okay. hundreds of hundreds of times every day, thousands of times. So if you're really conscious about ownership of your data, you've got your data and nobody can get it from you. Yes, absolutely. Interesting. On the, on the data ownership side, um, because it's configured the way you want it to be configured, you can have that data go wherever you would like it to go, be encrypted in any manner that you'd like it to be encrypted, and you really are in control over over that. Interesting. So is Modex a good choice for e-commerce merchants? Is e-commerce built into it or able to be built into it? Um, so we have, uh, I think we have a mutual friend in, uh, in Foxycart. Uh, and Foxycart was actually patterned after the way that Modex works. Um, it's, it's really one of those unique custom commerce applications out there that handles all the heavy lifting of things that you need to do to be successful with commerce, especially on the uh, PCI compliance end without having to worry about, oh, now I've got to deal with security audits and, and, and compliance and all the things that you've got to do to do that. It offloads yeah. that. And, and um, the, the neat thing about Foxycart uh, in that world is that they don't even care about a product catalog, which is the thing that you start with in virtually every single other e-commerce platform out there. Um, ModX mm. really cares about the product catalog. We care about displaying and building that catalog and letting people to browse and shop and interact with that catalog as much as anybody in any way that they want to, to do a custom configurator. There's a, uh, there's a, uh, a, a, uh, a boat manufacturer, Malibu Boats, that has a custom boat configurator. Those are wake boats, right? Yeah, so wake boats, ski boats, yeah. uh, you know, e expensive holes in the water that you keep throwing money at. So, uh, <laughs> but no, yeah. they, but you can build all these really neat applications and then and then use something like Foxycart to tie in. You can also obviously throw on PayPal buttons. You can throw in the Stripe integrations. Monix is a great integration platform. Um, so, so yeah, we we uh, we don't have a native, uh, and, and there also is a, a native uh, e-commerce solution from a great Monix developer called Modmore called Commerce, and it's got a neat little workflow engine on the back end for what happens after you've made the sale, which is really and truly the the hardest part of of, of e-commerce is shipping the products to your customers. is gets to be very challenging at scale. Right all the business of being in business. Well, that, that's gonna segue me to a question that I ask everyone. I'm just throwing you on the spot and you can just make up any answer you want here. But I always ask people, what secret advice do you have for e-commerce merchants? Like your, your best secret weapon that you're willing to share. Secret weapon is make your site load as fast as possible and make sure it absolutely never gets hacked. Well, that makes absolute sense. Because yeah, ultimately, that's gonna, it's all about customers. It's so funny. When I talk to people about e-commerce, it's all about the technology. But in reality, if you don't have customers, you don't have a business. There, there's a really super neat study um, that uh, Amazon did. They're, they're somewhat of a successful e-commerce company, from my understanding. 
<laughs> is that that book company? Um, yeah, they sell books, I think, <laughs> uh, and, and everything else that you, you get at your house every other day. Um, so, no, it, they, they tracked down, I think, a tenth of a second translated into, like, it was some ridiculous number of a million dollars per hour or something just by cutting a tenth of a second off of a page load time. Now, granted, most companies are not at Amazon scale. That, let's not be no. ridiculous about that. But if you give a customer a few extra seconds to really consider about are they going to make that spontaneous decision to get that dopamine hit, um, it, and not that it's manipulative, it's just the way that humans work. If you give people extra time to make that decision and, and go back on that decision, you're going to lose sales. It's just the way that, that the world works. If uh, if your page isn't loading fast enough, they're going to get frustrated and go away. It just is the way it works. Um, and it's it's psychology and conversion 101. It is. It's so true. And what, what strikes me with that and, and what, what has struck me a couple times in our conversation, Ryan, is everything has to work. Yeah. If the page loads at lightning speed and you have a crappy headline going back to the H1 tag, yep. that's not going to work. If the images don't look good, you'll lose trust. If the copy doesn't flow, if your checkout funnel is not effective, yes. you really are as strong as your weakest link yeah. in that world. And that's where a combination like ModX and FoxyCart really becomes a super interesting play because both of us, you know, both of our philosophies are let people experiment and do things and change things to work exactly the way they want and need it to work. And so you can do experiments that won't necessarily be possible any other way. Um, we had to act And affordably and quickly, I want to throw that in there. Yeah. And, you know, in, in, in an example of that, that's uh, from uh, that exact combination is there was a, a an eyewear company. And I don't know if, at least in Texas, um, prescription eyeglasses are tax free. Sunglasses that are not prescription or reading, reading glasses that are not prescription are taxed. So if you're going to adopt something like Shopify, at the time at least, and I, I think it's still the truth, you cannot mix taxable and non-taxable items in the same, uh, in the same uh, transaction. Oh. So you can't right. have this set of lenses or this set of glasses right here, frames, if you put a prescription lens in it, the whole frames and lenses are not taxed. If you put standard sunglasses or, or you know, blue blocker lenses in it, you're going to get taxed. And so you can't have that product, that one SKU, you know, which gets into inventory and product management and, and all of those things. You can't have that one SKU be both taxable and non-taxable in a traditional e-commerce platform and most e-commerce that's platforms. the painted in a corner that i was talking about earlier yeah that that makes that makes a lot of sense so if people wanted to get a hold of you or mod x and learn more how would they do that modx.com uh, it's the best way to get in touch with us uh, there's contact forms there uh, you'll find links to the forums to uh, support systems to everything that you need on that website it's a great place to reach us that's perfect and for any viewers that are watching this i think what i'd say if you know what your problem is and you've been frustrated in the past and you wish you had a solution for it i think that's somewhere where something like mod x and something like foxy cart could come together and solve a problem for you it, exactly that's that's where we're that's where we really shine today is, is creating that custom experience for your customers that you may be thwarted when trying to do it any other way. Ryan, I just want to thank you so much for joining today. Hey, appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Have a great day there. You too.